Hello, my name is Claire Mosier and welcome to AMWA After Hours, the Taos Society of Artists. Uh, this program will be about 15 minutes. So to get started, the Taos Society of Artists was a group of Anglo artists who spent all or part of the year in Taos, New Mexico in the early 1900s. Those, though the society was rather short-lived, existing from 1915 to 1927, it had a major impact on Western American art of the early 20th century. Members of the Taos Society of Artists were looking for uniquely American art while building on a foundation of European art tradition. They found a distinct American approach to art through the subject matter of the Southwestern region of the United States. The land, people, and cultures there. They banded together to better organize and show their art around the country, promoting both themselves and the American Southwest as an artist's haven, and hopefully selling some paintings in the process. The Taos Pueblo has been continuously inhabited. The Taos Pueblo has been continuously inhabited for over 1,000 years. The earliest buildings date to around 1,000 CE. The Taos Pueblo's tribal manifesto reads, quote, we who have lived upon this land from the days beyond history's records, far past any living memory, deep into the time of legend. The story of my people and the story of the place are one single story. No man can think of us without thinking of this place. We are joined together, end quote. The manifesto and history of the Taos people points to the power of place and the sway this particular place had over Anglo artists when they began traveling to Taos en masse in the early 1900s. The town of Taos, 2.7 miles from the Pueblo, was initially settled by the Spanish in the early 1600s. In 1760, the town was officially named Don Fernando de Taos, usually shortened to Taos. The close proximity of the Spanish founded town and the Pueblo allowed Anglo artists to live in the town with amenities they were used to while still being close to the people, land and cultures of the Pueblo, which filled so many of their canvases. The origins of Western American art comes from a European art tradition as seen in common materials like oil paints on canvas and bronze sculpture. Western American artists in the 18 and 1900s often studied in Europe and used their art knowledge to depict the people, places, ideas, and myths of the Western frontier and Western United States. Many of the Taos Society of Artist members studied in Europe themselves and were influenced by art techniques and trends in Europe in addition to their Southwestern surroundings. Common cities for American art students to study in were Paris, France, and Munich, Germany. Future Taos Society members, Ernest Leonard Blumenschein, Inger Irving Kaus, Catherine C. Critcher, Bert Gear Phillips, Julius Rolschelvin, and Joseph Henry Sharp studied in Paris, specifically at the Académie Julian. Rolschelvin and Sharp, who studied at the Royal Academy of Fine Rochelvin and Sharp also studied at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, as did other future member Ernest Martin Hennings. All members except for Oscar E. Burninghouse and William Herbert Dunton studied in Europe, mostly in France and Germany. Sharp, Blumenschein, and Phillips all met in Paris while studying at the Académie Julian. Sharp, a little older and more established in his career, recorded the younger art students, recommended the younger art students Blumenschein and Phillips visit house once they return to the U.S. These friendships forged by art students in Europe held, helped plant the seeds for the future artist group in Taos. Another tradition that made its way from Europe to the U.S. was the idea of art colonies. As most artists lived in large urban areas, such as Paris or Munich, New York or Philadelphia, 
it became common practice for artists to travel to more rural areas in the summers to escape the heat and extensive living conditions of the city and find new subject matter. This practice started in France in the 1800s and spread to the U.S. Artists started traveling to specific places, building communities in picturesque rural places like Provincetown, Massachusetts, Cop Coscob, Connecticut, and of course, Taos, New Mexico. In 1915, six painters founded the Taos Society of Artists. The purpose of this group was to publicize their art of the American Southwest and attract more artists to come and paint there. These six painters, often referred to as the founders, were Joseph Henry Sharp, pictured here, Bert Gear Phillips, Ernest Leonard Blumenshine, Oscar E. Burninghouse, Inger Irving Kaus, and William Herbert Buck. Dunton. The Taos Society of Artists organized yearly circuit exhibitions for members' work, usually starting on the East Coast and ending in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Some years, the exhibitions also traveled along the West Coast, and one year all the way to Honolulu, Hawaii. By 1915, some members already held national prominence, mostly through winning awards at juried exhibitions in Europe and the Eastern U.S., and used their influence to help organize these shows and promote the entire group. Their already existing clout, compounded by the annual exhibitions, generated much publicity for the group itself and its individual members. There are, were 19 members of the Taos Society of Artists, 12 full members, and seven associate members. In this presentation, I will talk about the 12 full members of the society, the aforementioned Sharp, Phillips, Blumenschein, Burning House, Kaus, and Dunton, as well as Victor Higgins, Walter Ufer, Julius Rolschelvin, Ernest Martin Hennings, Catherine C. Critcher, and Kenneth Miller Adams. The first of the Taos Society members to visit Taos was Joseph Henry Sharp, who did so in 1893 while on a magazine illustration assignment for Harper's Weekly. He was struck by the indigenous people and their clothing and art. Two years later, when he was studying at the Académie Julien in Paris, he met and befriended fellow American stu art students, Blumenschein and Phillips, regaling them with tales of the American West and Taos in particular. Sharp moved to Taos year round in 1912. Artistically, his Taos works often incorporated models he hired from the Pueblo although with an equal or stronger interest in the Lakota or Sioux and Apsalaga or Crow tribes of the Great Plains, he often mixed clothing and objects from various indigenous tribes in his paintings to portray a generalized, romanticized image of Indianness. In Sharp's painting War Talk, we see how he intermixes objects from different tribes. The two models in this painting are Hunting Sun on the left, and bawling deer on the right. Both are from this house Pueblo. Hunting Sun wears a shirt of Lakota origin, as is the war bonnet in the lower left corner of the painting. According to Sharp, he bought these two pieces in present day Montana, and they had been worn by Lakota warriors during the Battle of Greasy Grass, also called Battle of Little Bighorn. Sitting opposite Hunting Sun is the model bawling deer, wearing a shirt from the Taos Pueblo. In the background of the painting is a favorite prop of Sharp's, an elk skin with a green dragonfly painted on it. The elk skin was a gift from Flatiron of the Oglala Sioux, who sometimes modeled for Sharp when the artist visited Montana. We see evidence of Sharp's European training in the extreme attention to detail in the painting. One reason Sharp collected clothing and objects was to render such detail, focusing on the aesthetics of the object opposed to the cultural significance. His portrayal of indigenous people as an exoticized and romanticized people is also seen in 19th century European art. Particularly the European artists portraying people of the Middle East and Northern Africa, a concept known today as Orientalism for its focus on cultural exoticism and aesthetic drama, rather than cultural sensitivity or accuracy. 
Though Shark was the first of the Taos Society members to visit Taos, the mythic origin story of the society involves his two friends from his studies in Paris, Blumenshine and Phillips. The two younger artists returned to the U.S. in 1896, and in 1898, they embarked on a sketching trip to the Southwest. The story goes that in the mountains of northern New Mexico, on their way from Denver into Mexico, the wheel of their wagon broke. Philip stayed with their wagon and supplies, while Blumenschein took the horse and broken wheel to Taos, a town they knew about from Chart, for repairs. Both artists were stro- so struck by the area of Taos that they never continued on to Mexico. Phillips decided to live in the town year-round almost immediately, and for many years, Blumenschein would winter in New York and summer in Taos until moving there permanently in 1919. The story of the broken wagon wheel has been recounted over and over in reference to Taos as an art colony. And though it happened years before the founding of the Taos Society of Artists in 1915, it serves as the society's origin myth since it featured two of the founding members and their dramatic introduction to Taos. Both Phillips and Blumenschein encouraged other artists to visit and paint Taos, just as Sharp had done with them. In France, Bert Gere Phillips studied at the Académie Julien, where he learned an aesthetic realist style. This style is seen with many early artists in Taos and helps lend a sense of documentary realism to their paintings, even though many of the scenes they paint are imagined or staged not reflecting how the people in those scenes truly live their daily lives. While studying in France, Phillips was also exposed to a style of art called the Barbizon School. The Barbizon School focused on landscape scenes and people in traditional dress, believing there was inherent morality in more agrarian lifestyles opposed to the urban, increasingly industrial lifestyles. The belief of a purer life when connected to nature and the land became very popular in European and Anglo-American thought at the start of the 1900s, with increased industrialism and growing urban populations. In Europe, people looked to rural peasants as an embodiment of this ideal, and in the U.S., they looked to indigenous people like those at Taos Pueblo. This Romantic ideals seen in the Barbizon School painting immediately followed the period of United States manifest destiny and Western expansion, where the very same perceptions of indigenous people as dressing in traditional clothing and living close to the land was used as justification for forced assimilation and extermination of indigenous peoples and their lifestyles. In the Elk Hunter, we see some of this Barbizon influence. The figure in the painting is hunting with a bow and arrow, an action associated with more traditional and rural lifestyles, including with traditional tools of a bow and arrow, opposed to more modern tools like guns. The figure also appears to be dressed in traditional clothing, buckskin leggings, snowshoes, and a blanket. Though as addressed with sharp, Phillips often chose clothing that was not ethnographically accurate. In the case of his this figure, His right arm shows the shades of purplish blue to demonstrate the cold temperature he's hunting in. The purple blue of the figure's arm contrasts with the white snow and the yellow of the sky, showing off Philip's deft ability to manipulate color. His emphasis on color in outdoor scenes also shows the influence of the Barbizon School, its members advocating to paint on plein air or outside to better capture colors as they appear in nature. Formal art education in the 1900s often included the study and drawing of antique sculpture from Italy and Greece. Analyzing and drawing the forms of the sculptures was thought to help students learn human anatomy and precision of detail. Blumenstein shows his familiarity with European antique sculpture in The Peacemaker. In this painting, the front figure with his arm held out to the side, strikes a pose seen in antique statuary. A pose often associated with authority, power, and grace, like that found in the Greek statue of Apollo Belvedere. In this pose of authority that leads many art historians to name this figure in the titular peacemaker of the image. 
His arm connects not only the two groupings of people, but also spans across the gorge in the background, depicting where the Rio Grande River cuts through the Taos Plateau. The background of this piece sets it very much in Taos, though on the figures we we'll see a mixture of clothing from various tribes, just as we did in Sharp's paintings. This mixture of indigenous clothing, the white manta cloth around the waist of the peacemaker of Pueblo origin, whereas the headdresses worn by the other adult figures are more common to tribes of the Great Plains. Again, gives a sense of generalized and romanticized Indianness to the figures and their situation. Unlike most of the Taos Society of Artist colleagues, Oscar E. Burninghouse was primarily self-taught. His only formal art education was at the School of Fine Arts in Washington University in St. Louis. Both before and during his time at Washington University, Burninghouse worked for lithography and printing firms, teaching himself through observation and practice of drawing and painting. Working actively in lithography, Phillips was aware of the painting trends coming from Europe and the Eastern US. His first trip to Taos was in 1899 as part of a sketching trip to produce watercolor paintings for the Denver and Rio Grande Railway. In Taos, he met and befriended Phillips and visited the emerging art colony almost every summer until moving there year round in 1925. After his initial visit to Taos, Burning House explored painting in oils as he felt oil paint better captured the light, colors, and textures of the Taos area. Over time, he transitioned from an illustrator and lithographer to oil painter, again, mostly self-taught. He was aware of emerging popular trends in printing and painting, incorporating the attention to detail taught in European art schools and the lighter color palette influenced both by the Taos environment and French Impressionism. In The Pueblos Await the Dancers, Burning House seems a bit more respectful of what ceremonial aspects were open to be viewed by the public or people outside of the Pueblos than most Anglo artists of the time. Seen here, Burning House eliminates a ceremonial dance altogether and instead depicts the spectators waiting for the ceremony to begin. Pueblo religion was fascinating to many Anglo people, but often in their curiosity to learn everything they could about it, they crossed boundaries set up by those very religions. This could include sneaking in to witness or documenting through writing and images ceremonies only open to select members of Pueblos or entering specific places not open to the general public. Very rarely do Pueblo dance scenes painted or photographed by Anglo artists artists focus on the spectators, as Burning House's painting does. In many Anglo paintings of Pueblo religious ceremonies is a sense of Orientalism again that emphasizes and distorts differences between Pueblo faiths and Judeo-Christian faiths. Instead, Burning House shows the Pueblo religion not through its secrets or salacious differences from Judaism and Christianity, but in the anticipatory moment of believers before a ceremony's beginning. His focus is not on a specific ceremony, its meaning or its visuals, but the communal excitement shared by those gathered to watch it. Inger Irving Kaus studied at the Académie Julian in Paris from 1886 to 1890 and lived and worked in France until 1896. After his first visit to Taos in 1902, he painted many scenes of indigenous people creating art as seen in Indian Weaver. He greatly admired indigenous art such as weaving and pottery, both seen in this painting. An appreciation for indigenous art and artifacts and how Anglos viewed Pueblo people as infusing their everyday lives with art and spirituality gained popularity in early 1900s America. This is another extension of the backlash to urbanization and increased industrialization, like the popularity of paintings of agrarian scenes discussed with Phillips. Kaus paints a man modeled by Ben Lujan of the Taos Pueblo, creating a beautiful blanket on a traditional loom, preferable to a blanket made by machines and purchased at a store. To the right of the man is a small child playing with yarn, hinting at the innate artistic talent Kaus believes all Pueblo people have. Like Burning House, 
William Herbert Buck Dunton, received his art education in the United States and started his art career in illustration. Though Dunton only studied in the U.S., many of his teachers at the Cowell School of Art in Boston and the Art Student League in New York City, including Blumenschein, who taught at the Art Students League, had studied in Europe and in turn taught much of what they had learned there to their students. Dunton first visited Taos in 1912 at the suggestion of his art teacher and mentor, Blumenschein, and he moved there year-round in 1914. Dunton's European influences is seen in his process of creating a painting, often starting with small sketches in charcoal or pencil to focus on line and composition. He would then create small color studies with oil paint to see how color impacted his composition. For the finished painting, he would often draw onto the canvas with charcoal, then paint over the outline. In his illustration career, which emphasized his precise line work, Dunton often utilized diagonal lines that gave a sense of drama. In the shower, we see how successfully his line and color work come together. The horizontal lines in the foreground, the mountains in the background, and then the vertical lines of the Virga descending from the clouds pack the painting with action. We see his careful application of color in the sky to depict Virga a phenomenon when rain appears to reach from the clouds toward the ground. Victor Higgins was elected to the Taos Society of Artists in 1917, two years after the group was founded and three years after Higgins' first visit to the art colony. He began his ed art education in 1899 at the age of 15 when he moved from Indiana sh to Chicago where he studied at the Holmes Art School, the Academy of Fine Art, and the Art Institute of Chicago. From 1911 to 1913, he traveled around Europe for, to further his art education, and records indicate he studied in Munich, Germany, privately with artist Hans van Hyck, and in Paris at the Académie de la Grande Chambière. While in Munich, he met and befriended future Taft Society members Walter Ufer and Ernest Martin Hennings. Overall, Higgins felt his European education didn't benefit him beyond teaching him traditional realism basics. The more modernist works coming out of Europe at the time influenced him more than the academic art fundamentals he received in his studies. As he continued his career, Higgins experimented more with modernism than many of his fellow Taft Society members. In Pueblo of Taos, painted as a commission for the Santa Fe Railway, we see how Higgins applied aspects of European modernism to depicting the Taos Pueblo. Similar to the Burning House painting, Higgins pictures people gathered at the start of the Fiesta of San Geronimo. Unlike Burning Houses, the Pueblos await the dancers, which focuses on the people and landscape. Higgins's Pueblo of Taos focuses on the color and shapes used to make the people and landscape. We see buildings and vehicles simplified into basic shapes. The Pueblo itself rectangles with very little detail in the background, contrasted with the smooth roundness of the Anglo visitors covered wagon and the Pueblo ovens in the lower left. The multicolored pattern blankets of the figures in the foreground give way to simplified figures in the background. The blankets covering their bodies, represented with just one solid color. This emphasis on design elements of a painting, like shape and color, over realistic detail are commonly seen in modern works coming out of Europe in the early 1900s that rejected the rigid academic European training of art canon of the previous centuries. Walter Ufer was elected to the Taos Society of Artists in 1917, along with Higgins. The two artists both first visited Taos in 1914 with financial support from the former mayor of Chicago, Carter Harrison, and a syndicate of wealthy art patrons. Harrison arranging for the two artists to visit Taos and getting first opportunity to purchase works created there at a discount speaks to the growing popularity of Taos-inspired paintings in the 19-teens. Also like Higgins, Ufer began his art studies in Chicago before traveling to Europe to further them. Ufer's foray into art started as 
as an apprentice to a Chicago-based engraver, Dr. Johann Jürgens. When Jürgens moved to Germany in 1893, he invited Ufer to move there as well and continue working for him. While Ufer worked as an engraver, he studied at various art schools in Germany until returning to Chicago in the late 1890s. Back in Chicago, he focused his studies more on painting instead of engraving at the Francis Smith School, which was affiliated with the French Académie Julian and taught in the French academic tradition. In 1911, Ufer returned to Germany, studying painting under the artist and art teacher Walter Thor before moving back to Chicago. According to Ralph Phillips, the son of Bert Gere Phillips, the man who modeled for this painting, Manuel de la Unes, is of Spanish descent, his family having lived in Taos since the 17th century. His Hispanic people and culture were not as popular a subject as indigenous people and culture in Taos. Popular angle opinion at the time did not associate Hispanic people with a closeness to nature and inherent nobility as they associated to indigenous peoples. Taos paintings of non-Indigenous subject matter did not sell as well. The Hispanic traditions, all often with European roots, were seen as less exotic to the average art buyer. Even in this painting of a Taos local proud of his Spanish heritage, Ufer uses Indigenous art and tools in decoration, arranging a group of pots curving around the bottom left corner, mirroring the curve of Unessa's shoulder and back in the upper, upper right corner of the painting. Unessa's facial expression and overall demeanor show a sense of strength and pride, though his sloping shoulders and tightly gripped cane contrast with the sense of age and weariness. This contrast of pride and weariness is often seen in Taos society paintings of Hispanic subjects, hinting at a less romanticized side of working with the land than many of their idyllic paintings of indigenous subjects. Julius Rolschel then was elected a full member of the Taos Society in 1918 after one year as an associate member. His time in Taos was brief compared to other Taos Society members as he spent most of his adult life living and working in Europe. His art education started at the Cooper Union in New York and with a private art teacher, Ernst Plassmann, who encouraged Rolschelvin to travel to Europe for further study. In 1877, Rolschelvin took Plassmann's advice. His European studies included the Royal Academy of Art in Dusseldorf, as well as the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Munich. Studying under Frank Duvenek in Germany and Italy, and the Académie Julian in Paris. Rolschelvin and Kaus befriended each other while they both attended the Académie Julian. Rolschelvin returned to the U.S. in 1915 because of World War I, and in 1916 decided to visit his friend Kaus in Taos. This visit lasted four or five years until Rolschelvin moved back to Italy. In 1924, the Taos Society voted to drop his status to an associate member, as it was evident he would not be returning to the U.S. and participating in their annual exhibitions. He stayed so long in Taos because he was drawn to the land and the way the people living there seemed to coexist so harmoniously with that land. Indian Market is another image where we see a romanticized, exoticized depiction of indigenous life in Taos. The large feather headdress and colorful blankets give 20th century audiences a hint that they are looking at indigenous people, even if there is not as much detail on the clothing in, as in paintings by artists like Kaus and Burning House. Living in Europe for so many years, Rolschelvin was aware of more modern styles emerging. In this piece, we see aspects of German expressionism which was an art, literature, and political movement of the earliest 20th century in Germany. German Expressionism rejected the traditional teachings of art academies, like the ones Rolschelvin had studied at, and instead emphasized personal expression. In paintings, personal expression was often conveyed through bold colors, like we see in Indian Market, as well as elongated forms. 
Ernest Martin Hennings became a member of the Taos Society of Artists in 1924, though he first visited Taos in 1917 with the financial help of Carter Harrison and his Chicago syndicate, just as Efer and Higgins had in 1914. Hennings began his studies at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1900. The curriculum there was based off of European academies and included standard European teaching practices, such as studying classical sculptures and old master paintings, and drawing and painting nudes from those classical sculptures, as well as from live models. In 1912 to 1914, Henning studied in Munich at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts and under Walter Thor, as Ufer had. In Germany, Hennings was particularly drawn to Jugendstil, or Young style, the German style of Art Nouveau, which encouraged drawing artistic inspiration from architecture, decorative arts, and nature, and visibly features sinuous lines and elegant curves. Henning, Hennings painted Taus Plaza Hitching Post around 1945, in remembrance of the year he moved to Taus full-time, 1921. The scene shows how Hennings remembered the town of Taos in 1921. We see a mixing of indigenous, Hispanic, and Anglo cultures in the buildings, a derby of both Pueblo and Spanish styles, as well as in the people, indigenous people marked by their colorful blankets, Hispanic and Anglo people marked by their black suits and cowboy garb. We also see evidence of traditional We also see evidence of the traditional, the adobe houses, the wagons and horses, mixing with the modern, the utility lines and cars. And we also see aspects of the Jugendstil style in the curved lines and shapes within the painting, not just in the people and animals, but also in the building roofs, the hitching post wall and the trees as well as the texture of the snow. Though the scene is very much of a specific American place, Taos Plaza, at a very specific time, the winter of 1921, it still reveals the foundations of Henning's European art education. Catherine C. Critcher became a Taos Society of Artists member in 1924. She was the only woman member of the society and sadly, the only member not represented in the Anschutz collection. So if you know any of her New Mexico works for sale, just let us know. She first visited Taos in 1920, and by that time was a successful portrait painter and art teacher with a solid European art teaching background. She did take art classes in the U.S. before traveling to Europe, as so did many of her fellow society members. She studied briefly at the Cooper Union in New York, then at the Corcoran School of Art in Washington, D.C. The Corcoran modeled its curriculum after the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris, France. In 1904, she enrolled at the Académie Julian in Paris and initially struggled with taking classes in French. From 1905 to 1909, while continuing her studies, she opened a school of her own, the Cours Critcher, which helped American art students adjust to French academic art teaching. Critcher not only studied in France, but grew familiar enough with their teaching practices to help other American art students adjust to them. Recognized primarily for her portraits, this painting, Indian Women Making Pottery from the Smithsonian American Art Museum, is an unusual genre seen by Critcher. Painting a scene of Indigenous people making art was a common theme for Taos society members, especially cows. In Pueblo cultures, women were the primary pottery makers. Perhaps in this painting, Critcher recognizes a camaraderie with fellow women artists. An aspect of Art Nouveau and Jugendstil style coming out of Europe at this time was that all art forms were equally important and beautiful, whether the medium be paint on canvas, pottery, textiles, what have you. Anglo painters in Taos admired and often drew inspiration from indigenous art, whether in mimicking patterns or colors from indigenous art, or including art like pottery itself as props in their own paintings. 
In Critcher's case, she highlights the care women artists take in their craft, whether it be pottery or painting. Kenneth Miller Adams was the final full member of the Taos Society of Artists, elected in 1926, shortly before the society disbanded in 1927. Adams's art education was largely in the U.S., starting with private lessons with George M. Stone while growing up in Kansas, and then onto the Art Institute of Chicago, um, and finally the Art Students League in New York under Andrew Dosberg. Both Stone and Dosberg had traveled to France. Stone had studied at the École des Beaux-Arts, and his training there probably influenced his teachings. Dosberg did not in, attend any European art academies, but he did visit the studio of Henri Matisse and countless museums. Modern styles like Cubism had a profound effect on Dosberg, who in turn introduced those styles to Adams and encouraged the younger artists to visit Europe himself. In 1921, Adams studied at the Académie Ransom in Paris. And he also traveled to Italy, visiting as many art museums and galleries as he could in both France and Italy to absorb all that he could of European arts. In 1923, he returned to the U.S., and Dosberg encouraged Adams to paint in New Mexico, even supplying the young artist with a letter of introduction to Walter Ufer in Taos. Ufer helped Adams find studio space to rent and helped Adams integrate into the larger Taos art community and eventually the Taos Society of Artists. In the Mission Church, we see aspects of Adams's studies in Europe. His brushstrokes are visible. The way he layers paint to convey color and light are reminiscent of the French Impressionists. In the midground of the painting, the planes of the buildings are seemingly flattened and simplified when compared to the textured details of the plants and landscape. This hints at the cubist influences of Adams first received through his art teacher and mentor, Andrew Dosberg. With Adams's modernist sensibilities, he was less interested in portraying Taos as a romantic rustic setting and more interested in experimenting with how to visually represent the spaces and shapes that he found in the Taos area. The overall goal of the Taos Society of Artists to promote the American Southwest as an artistic destination and to generate painting sales was partially successful. Their art was exhibited widely and is still quite popular today, in part because they were showing a relatively new Southwestern subject matter to an American public, but through art mediums and techniques that public was already used to seeing. Oil paintings in a European academic tradition. The society was less successful in generating sales from their annual exhibition. And most scholars believe the lack of sales contributed to the dissolution of the society in 1927. Regardless, the Taos Society of Artists left their mark on American art and helped encourage Anglo artists to travel and paint the Southwest, an area of the country that continues to inspire artists till this day.